Welcome to KJV Cafe, where the truths of God's Word come alive. Grab a hot cup of coffee or tea and spend some time learning about our Savior and Lord, Jesus Christ. Listen now to Pastor Clark Covington of Heartland Community Baptist Church as he explores great insights from the Word of God. I'd like to ask you a question today. Have you ever thought about what it does to your character when you follow the Lord, how it might make you appear in front of others, how your character uh, is regarded or you as a person, how you're looked at as you follow the Lord, as you grow in his words and his commands? Have you ever thought about what that does? That's what I'd like to talk to you about here today, how loving and living for God makes us better people. Is that not true? Loving and living for God, it makes us better people. It's a byproduct of a deep and true faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You become a better person. Uh, Maybe you have thought about this idea that God's commands make us better. Even our enemies, you know, they, they too will respect us when we live for God. And if you think about someone that has an enemy, typically they're all about disrespect, right? But the Bible's got this wonderful verse, Proverbs 16, 7. That's our text verse today. Proverbs 16, verse 7. When a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. Wow. When a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. That's awesome. So here we have this verse. I love verses where, you know, we don't need a deep commentary on this. It's pretty self-evident when a man's ways, when they please the Lord, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. Well, if that peace with him, they probably respect them. They probably know maybe deep down that he's right. They, they have a reverence for this person. And that's not when a man's ways please man. No. Or when a man's ways please someone important, or when a man has status, or when a man has money. It says, when a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. Amen. What's Proverbs? That's the book of wisdom. And this is a great nugget here. When a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. Proverbs 16, 7. And so I just want to spend a little while here today talking about why it is that when we serve God and when we please God with our lives, that even our enemies are at peace with us. And it's just an awesome verse. I I want to start with the idea of what happens first here. What's the process to get to this point? Well, it's got to be longing for God, right? Our character molding, you know, it starts with a longing or a desire to know God. I mean, look at our our verse, when a man's ways please the Lord, how did that man get about his ways? He must have longed for God. He must have had a desire to know God. I mean, think about this. If I were wanting to please my wife, would I not have to first know what her ways are, what she approves of, what actions she desires to see of people that she, you know, that she likes and how would I do that? I'd have to seek and long for her. I'd have to care enough. And that's the question I want you to think about today is do we care enough today to know God's ways? Do we care enough to seek God? Do we care enough to long for God like like we would a spouse or a girlfriend or a boyfriend? You know, do we care enough to really understand who they are? Or uh, you can use another uh, idea here, like uh, a father and a son, and the son really wants to get to know the father's ways, right? Well, God's our heavenly father, amen. Do, Do we really want to? That's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to kind of punch through all the times we've been told to follow God and love God and all this and get to the heart of it. Do you? Do you really? Can you understand this? You have to care enough. Think about it. God can mold us into who he wants us to be only if we're seeking him. If we aren't desiring to know him, how can he? I mean, think about that. Uh, Of course, he's got all power and he could, but why would he if we don't care enough to seek him? It's very important what we do. You know, we're, we're called to walk the Christian walk. We're called to take up the cross. These are physical action words and phrases. These are ideas that involve action and motion and discipline and obedience. These are not ideas that just fall on our lap and happen. Amen. You know, think of it this way. 
where do, in our lives, where do we push towards each day? Do we push towards God or do we push towards the world? I mean, when hardships happen, do we long for God or do we look elsewhere? That's a really good point. I mean, uh, there's many quotes out there about, you know, you really find the true character of someone, not when things are going well, but when things are tough. That's when you see kind of what's underneath the facade and what they're really made of. And so when we go through those things and our true character comes out, we're going through hardships. Is our true character pointing to the world or pointing to God? Do we look at God as a refuge from evil for the oppressed? Do we look at God as a refuge in times of trouble, a shelter? Uh, we had a prayer meeting last night at church where we discussed God as our, our, our fortress, right? A mighty fortress, a strong fortress, a, uh, an area that we can go in prayer in our prayer closets. We can go confidently and we're protected and we have uh, just God's graces upon us. And he hears our prayers. He hears the prayers of the righteous on and on and on. Do we look at God as that refuge? We should. Psalm 9, 9 through 10. The Lord also will be a refuge for the oppressed, a refuge in times of trouble. And they that know thy name will put their trust in thee, for thou, Lord, hast not forsaken them that seek thee. Oh, that's good. The Lord has not forsaken them that seek him. So we know God is there for us as what a refuge. What's a refuge? A condition of being safe or sheltered from pursuit, danger, or trouble. Something or someone providing shelter. We are safe with God. God hasn't forsaken us. He hasn't left us behind. He hasn't forgotten us. He hasn't taken his great eyes off of us or his hands of mercy away from us. So we should long for him because he's so able and willing to protect us. You know, the idea is that God is much more willing, I believe, to show us mercy than to have to chasten us as believers. And for those that are not believers, you know, my Bible says, my King James Bible says, whosoever uh, shall believe on the name of the Lord Jesus shall be saved. Amen. It's a whosoever salvation. God wants us all to be saved. That's his will for, I believe, the whole world, every one of us, to come to know him. Now, of course, we know not all will. And we know some will uh, reject, uh, you know, um, gospel preaching and some uh, will will reject uh, fundamental doctrine. But we stand on the word of God. The word of God tells us that whosoever will, that whosoever will believe, not by their works, not by their wealth, not by anything, but believing in Jesus Christ and his blood shed on the cross for our sin. Amen. So do we long for God in that regard? You know, do we, do we, or, or are we looking at it in a way that makes us shy away from God, uh, intimidated by God, uh, afraid that we're going to just be disciplined by God? Are we looking at God for the wonderful, merciful God that he is, or are we looking elsewhere? And you know, when we long for God and when we look for God, that, 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 that kind of molding in our character, you know what the result is? It makes us free to love and give because we look for God, then we find him as Psalm 9, 9 through 10 tells us, the Lord's our refuge for the oppressed in times of trouble. And they that know thy name will put their trust in thee for thou, Lord, has not forsaken them that seek thee. Amen. So we know he's here for us. We seek him, we long for him. And then what happens to our character? It makes us free to love and to give. Knowing we have peace and shelter, we have our needs met in God. It gives us freedom to care for others. Have you ever thought about this idea that you know what? If we have God, we don't really need anything else because he's going to meet our needs. There's scripture, there's much scripture in the Bible about how God says, says, look, don't worry about food and clothing, et cetera. Your needs will be met. And, and, you know, we've got, uh, examples about the, the, the sparrow that doesn't uh, reap or sow and is still fed. And, and, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're so blessed by God. And so we don't need to worry about our needs being met. Amen. He's going to provide for us. And then that then frees us up, gives us freedom to care for others. Here's another example. Let's say my son, CJ, uh, he's three, about to be four, has a friend at school that doesn't have a jacket. CJ feels free to give his friend his jacket because CJ knows his dad at home has lots of jackets for him still. So CJ feels free to give. His needs are met. So he's just free to go ahead and give. You see how this works? You see how it's, it, it's, it's this idea of we're protected and provided for. We have all our needs met. Our, and, and certainly our most deepest needs by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So go ahead and give. Feel free to give. 
We can give ourselves not just materially, but also in time and energy, right? You giving people your time. I mean, uh, lately, uh, you know, as I've studied the Bible, one of the themes that I think have, has kind of come out of of God's word to me, and and not 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 overtly in a, in an actual text, but just seeing the subjects, seeing how how the Bible gives us the, these uh, patterns of time and history and what's happened to people, and oh, time is so short. And oh, time is like a currency, right? It's there's a value to time and, and energy too. We only have it's a finite amount here on this earth. Uh, you know, the Bible talks about life is like a poof of smoke, like a like a like a vapor. It's just gone here one day, gone the next, right? And so when we give time, that's very important. When we give material things, that's very important. When we give intercessory prayer, praying for others, that's very important. Uh, fellowship, we're giving of that, you know, giving of ourselves. I mean, gosh, when you're fellowshipping, you, you know, you're, you're having to kind of trust people and get out there. And again, you can do that knowing that you have the love of the Father and you have your needs met. Discipleship, you know, helping lead others in Christ and selflessness and, and ha- being a listening ear. The list could go on and on. We can do all of these things knowing that God will give us a measure of what we need to move forward. Our character molding and the positive outcome of that molding all starts with a longing for God. So just to kind of sum this first idea up here, our character is made better. We are made better, even to the point where our enemies will respect us. How? By longing for God, because when we're longing for God, our character starts being molded. I mean, there's obviously humility there because we're admitting that we can't do it on our own. Isn't that what being saved is all about, by the way? Admitting that we're sinners, understanding our sin nature, and then accepting Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. It's the same thing. Admitting that, hey, once we're saved, we still can't do it, Lord. We still, look, we still need you every single day. That's how you programmed us. That's how you made us. We are incomplete without you, Lord. So we are seeking you, and we are seeking your strong hand of protection. This preacher needs the Lord every single day. Matter of fact, more and more so every single day, I need Jesus Christ to lead me and guide me and carry me through. There's that old song, I can't even walk without you holding my hand. Amen, that's true today. But it all starts this idea that we need him. And then we understand, okay, well, let's long for him. Let's let's desire him. Let's let's chase after him. Let's pursue him. Well, how do you do that? You can't see God. That's what some skeptic might say. I don't know. Pick up his written word, his living word. Amen. That King James Bible, get in there, dig in deep, read it, study it. Don't read it like you're just reading something for fun for a minute. Read it like you're reading the most important book you've ever read in your life. Read it like you're reading something that is worth millions and billions and trillions of dollars because that's what it is. It is our basic instructions before leaving earth. As one preacher told me one time, it's so important to be in God's word daily. Amen. And uh, I was telling my wife the other day, she said, you're doing a lot of Bible study. I said, honey, uh, I'm the preacher of the church. If I stopped doing Bible study, I, I, th- I think I'd be selling everybody short at the church. I think everybody would have to go find another church. Amen. You should be glad that your preacher spent, spent a time in a book, but it shouldn't only be your preacher. The idea here is that you realize your need for God, then you long for God, and then you take that next step and get into his word through uh, Bible study, as well as praying and seeking his face and fervent prayer. The Bible says to pray without ceasing, staying in, in, in line with his commands, living for him. And all of a sudden these things start to come into place where we feel like, oh, you know what? I can be fearless here. I can give, like I can give a lot. I can pray about it and just give until it hurts. I can, I can have uh, time and you know what, if I'm going to give this time and the Lord's going to make it up somehow, he's going to find a way. Have you ever noticed that when you, you're serving God, some things that they seem to just get, get, uh, worked out for you. Amen. I just want to brag on God real quickly here. Uh, the other day I had to do something. I don't remember what it was, but I was doing some church related thing, I think in the morning. And then in the afternoon, I had to get to the bank by four o'clock or they were going to close. And I got there at three fifty nine. Amen. And that's just God's little wink at me saying, I got your back. And he does have my back. And that's, you know, we give our time to the Lord. It's always the best investment we can make. And all, the whole idea here is when we turn to God, when we seek, seek God, we long for God, it makes us better. It makes us better. I mean, even our enemies cannot deny that we are better for it, that we are respectable for it, that we are admirable for it. And it's nothing that we did. It is all our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But it's a testimony again. I believe that's why the scripture's in here, at least one reason why. It's a testimony to 
God's righteousness, to God's power, to the idea that we were all born, as the Bible says, with some light in us, that everyone can recognize it, and that is great. You're listening to KJV Cafe. As you learn the great truths in God's Word, we encourage you to take the verses mentioned in this episode and study them. Trusting God will open your eyes to a deeper understanding of Himself. Now here's Pastor Clark with the rest of today's message. So we've talked about longing for God. And the next point I have here, dealing with how God makes us better as people, is realizing that we're loved by God. So longing for God, and then secondly, loved by God. Our character molding and shaping continues with the understanding of God's great love for us. Romans 5, 8, But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus died for us in our imperfect state. He died for us sinners in the most horrific way to ensure we could be saved by believing on him. Eternally saved, only by the blood, Jesus shed his great blood for us. I mean, think about that. We are loved by God. You know, I I was outlining this message uh, last week, and, and it was interesting because I was looking at you know, we should long for God and uh, we should live for God. And, you know, I said, I had to say, wait a minute. It's it's not us. We, We didn't do anything. It's God that loved us. Amen. It's God that sought us out. Amen. It's God that saved us. It's God that chose us to be saved. We know that he foreknew that, uh, everything he knows the end from the beginning. Amen. And so for some reason he has chosen us. He's, he's given us hope. He's allowed our, our hearts to be soft. He's allowed us to, to have the Holy Spirit come into us as we accept Jesus Christ as Savior. He gave us a way. And so God's love towards us has to be the most important thing in our character transformation, in our character evolution, in the way that we change that makes us better. It's God's love for us. And, you know, I think people sometimes can get lost in this idea of God's love because it's so immense. And oftentimes we have to look at it in very practical terms to wrap our heads around it because it truly is beyond even our probably, uh, you know, human worldly understanding. Uh, Truly, I don't think we'll ever understand God's true love for us until we get to heaven and we have a uh, glorified body and, and, and uh, presumably a glorified mind, and we have knowledge and we can understand these things. Uh, but, but God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's Romans 5, 8. This is the fact. Jesus Christ died for us, and we couldn't have done anything to make it like uh, for him to be, uh, you know, given anything, done anything, uh, you know, paid some kind of thing. No, he did everything for us. So Jesus is God, part of the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. And Jesus comes down to this earth in, in the word you see over and over again, you start reading the commentaries, you start getting into people talking about what Jesus did, is condescension. He, he came down to us. He humbled himself so much. This idea of great meekness, great great strength and power under control to come down to, to sinful old man, a wormy man, a broken man, to come into this world and say, there's nothing you can do for me, but I'm going to put your sinful shoes on and I'm going to go drink from that bitter cup and have the most brutal death of all mankind, of all history, because you say, well, it was brutal, but was it the most brutal? It was because he had to take on that sin, all mankind, he had to do it in order to atone for our sin debt, to pay our sin debt. The Bible calls it the propitiation for our sin debt. Amen. Jesus Christ had to do it. Hallelujah. Why did God do that? God had to do it because the sin curse entered with Adam in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve beguiled by the devil, ate of the forbidden fruit. And that's how it, that's how death came by Adam, the first Adam. And then Jesus comes, the last Adam, amen. And he dies on the cross 
for our sins. And we know that he didn't stay in the grave long, amen, three days, and then he was resurrected. And that resurrection is proof that Jesus Christ is Lord, amen. Woo, I'm getting a little excited here. That's proof that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he is Savior. You look at all the other gods out there, they weren't raised from the dead. No, God raised Jesus Christ. None of these dumb idols, as the Bible calls it, or false gods. Jesus is the true God. He was seen by over 500, amen, that's in the Bible. Uh, You know, that's plenty of witnesses, and it gives us proof and hope that Jesus Christ truly is the Son of God, is our Savior, and by him enduring this and in, in going through this and again, condescending himself down, you know, that word condescending is often used uh, in a negative sense. But when you read the, the commentators and stuff, they use it in the sense of just somebody coming down to our sinful level, humbly, you know, thinking about the idea they're plucking at his beard. You know, if my own kids pluck at my beard, I'm going to have to going to have to ask God to control my hand, okay? They're plucking his beard. He is God. He could think it, and they'd all be evaporated. They'd all be incinerated. You know, they went to go try to get him uh, there when he was uh, praying and, and uh, with the disciples, and, and they asked who he was, and they all fell down. Well, why did they fall down? Because he has all power. He could easily have just uh, eliminated everyone, annihilated everyone, set up his kingdom. He didn't have to do it, but he endured it for us. And what that all comes down to is a great love for us. Amen. We love Jesus here. Look, our church, we do uh, communion a lot, which is interesting for a little independent Baptist church to be doing communion a lot. But, you know, we, we remember that sacrifice. We remember Jesus. We, we, we spend time with that, 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 well, cracker, I say bread, but that cracker, uh, we sp- spend time with it, thinking about this idea that, that Jesus was broken for us, amen. And no, he didn't have any broken bones, but he was nailed to the cross, amen, for our sins. He was punished by us. You know, we start really thinking about it. Was it the Romans? Was it the Jews? Was it this, that? Look, it's us. It's me. It's you. That's who put him on the cross. It's our sins. And he gladly bore that for what was to come, his glory. And he deserves all glory. He deserves all praise. He deserves all all worship. Amen. And so it's God's great love that when we realize how much he loves us, whoo, that changes us. Does it not? Man, that changes us. What does it change? I mean, it changes our form. We were sinners headed for hell, but when we're saved by, by the blood of Jesus Christ, by accepting him, we realize his grace. We realize God in the flesh enduring the sin curse for the saved. And then we realize our place being born again, bought by the blood of Jesus. Then God's true and unspeakable love toward us starts to become apparent. I can't say it completely becomes apparent because words can't describe it. Amen. Words cannot describe it. God gave us breath. God uh, helped us get home without dying. God did this. God did that. That's why it's like, I can't even describe it, but I know it. Amen. I know it's good. I know it's amazing. I know it's fantastic. I know it's praiseworthy. I know it's worth giving him all we've got because he gave us his precious son. Amen. God's love is so magnificent. It's hard to describe or put in words, but he loves us so much. And he made a way for us to receive eternal life, to be with him despite our condition. And so what does that result in our character? We become humble servants. We become kingdom minded. We start thinking about heaven. We start thinking about uh, pleasing God and living for God. And all of a sudden, you know, the ways of the world, the, 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 the bait that the devil will throw out there to cast out at you, to try to tempt you into the ways of the world. They just, they, you know, as the, as the, uh, old hymn goes, you know, they kind of grow strangely dim. You know, we just, things become much clearer that, that we're heaven bound and that we're going to store up our treasures in heaven, that we're going to live uh, forever with God in heaven and that our home is in heaven and that he is a, a, a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful God. And he's worthy of our, our sacrifice. He's worthy of us being pure and clean and living perfect as he is perfect and on and on and on. Our character becomes better and people, they can't understand it. But what I believe happens, and you know, I can't prove this, but I believe this happens as we become more like God and people realize their own form and they realize who we are, they start to realize there must be a God because they couldn't do that on their own. Thirdly, living for God. So I spoke about longing for God. I have spoke about the idea that God loved us so much. And now I want to talk about living for God. We're longing for God and that changes our character. We realize God's great love for us and that greatly changes our character. And then living for God. 
Our character is chiseled and molded more and more as we purpose to live by God's commands. Knowing we long for him and how much he loves us, we press forward to please him in what? In dedicated obedience. Look, this is the theme, I think, of the last year or two of my ministry. God tells us to be obedient. And I preach it to my church over and over again. I think they think I'm a broken record. But that's truly, I believe, the time we live in. With so much chaos and so much just uncertainty and all these things, people, I believe, are in danger of going astray, and some have. And in God's word, we clearly see, he says, trust me, and by trusting me, be obedient. If we aren't obedient to God, that's where a lot of trouble ensues, and God is afar off. James 4, 8 through 10. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners. Purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Then look at this in verse 9. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. And then verse 10. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. And this is good right here. And he shall lift you up. James 4, 8 through 10 is giving us command. Get close to God and he'll get close to you. Then we have to get right with him. We got to repent. We got to cleanse our hands. We got to purify our hearts. We can't be double-minded. What does that mean? We can't have one foot in the world and one foot in church. We can't have one foot in carnal things and one foot in spiritual things. We need to be sold out to God. And then what happens when we get sold out to God? I love that in verse nine, you're going to be afflicted and you're going to mourn and you're going to weep and your laughter will be turned to mourning. Look, if you truly are in love with the Lord here today, you're going to have seasons where you're going to be afflicted. You're going to have seasons where you mourn. Uh, that that laughter, especially that rebellious laughter, that uh, worldly laughter, the, the inappropriate stuff, that's going to be turned to mourning. You're going to mourn for those uh, that are afar off and headed to hell. And your joy is going to be turned to heaviness. This is the Christian walk. It's not always easy. Amen. But we're called to do what? Humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift us up. Amen. That's James 4, 8 through 10. He'll lift us up. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. What that means there is we go through this process. We get close to God. We get right with God. We get on the firing line. We get on the narrow path and we, we pick up our cross. We bear each other's burdens. We bear uh, and care about the things God cares about. And that leads to uh, soberness and to heaviness. And then we realize our state. We realize our lowliness. And that's when God steps in and says, I'll lift you up. I'll pick you up. Ooh, there's no better way to be picked up than to be picked up by God. Amen. He is the great picker upper. He is the one, uh, I don't know about you, but can turn my mood in an instant just by his little heavenly hand on my back, telling me it's going to be okay through his word, through his scripture, through a song, through a verse, God is there. Amen. And that is the way it should be as a Christian is living for God. Not always easy and definitely dealing with very weighty issues, but always, always giving it to God and relying on his great strength and being brought through by his great strength and giving him all the glory. So helping others, in Christ-like obedience, that's what happens when we live for God. That's the result in our character. We become obedient, Christ-like obedience, and that leads to service, putting other needs before our own, giving sacrificially, spreading the gospel with a fervent spirit of joy and excitement, testifying to God's amazing grace in our own life. All this happens when we long for God, when we realize how much God loves us and when we live for him each day. And this is when our character is molded to a point when even our enemies can't find fault in us. Even our enemies respect us because God's ways are so good and right. Even wicked man can't find fault in them. That's reason enough to live for Jesus. Let's keep living for Jesus. Let's see the fruit of living for Jesus in our lives. And let's recognize that it's great. It's wonderful. A byproduct of our faith is we are respected by others because God is righteous and it's reflected in us when we live for him. Thanks for visiting the cafe today. Our goal is to inspire you with the truth and depth of God's word in a straightforward manner. 
Do you know Jesus? You can today. Visit kjvcafe.com to learn more about God's great plan of salvation for all of mankind. Until next time, remember, as Matthew chapter 6, verse 33 puts it, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Righteousness.